Good morning, everybody. Welcome to yet another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about ecology. Today's topic is going to be determinants of climate. So like always, let me get you your objectives and we'll get going. By the end of this video, here's the stuff I need you to know. First up, explain the Coriolis effect and its relationship to global wind and ocean currents. Describe the relationship between Earth's tilt and the seasons and understand the basics of ocean currents. Before we jump into that, let me give you a quick overview of today's video. Today's going to be all about the major Earth processes that determine the climate of different parts of the world. These are talking about global processes and their effects are on the Earth as a whole. So as we move through this, just kind of keep in mind that the things that we are talking about are things that determine the climate for different areas of the world. And also, this video might be a bit long. My apologies. So first thing that I need you to know about, and this is often a really hard concept for students to get, but it is the Coriolis effect. And you need to understand the Coriolis effect for the rest of the video to make sense. So here are the major things that I need you to know. First thing to recognize is that the Earth is spinning. You all know that. But one thing that we don't often think about is that the equator of the Earth spins much more quickly than the poles. If you think about this, it'll kind of make sense because the whole Earth makes a rotation once a day. Now, if you are standing at the equator, you are going to make one rotation all the way around the Earth. If you stand at the North Pole, you are going to make one rotation all the way around the Earth. The interesting thing is, because the equator is so much bigger than the North Pole, so the equator's got a diameter of something around 25,000 miles, the diameter of the Earth up here might only be a couple thousand miles, because the equator is so much bigger, this means that it has to spin more quickly in order to make one revolution if you were to compare it to the North Pole. So in any given day, the equator will move roughly 1,700 miles per hour in order to go all the way around in 24 hours. The same spot on the North Pole will only move 180 miles per hour in order to make a revolution. So depending on where you are on the Earth, you are actually traveling slower or faster through space. So here's the reason that this is important. If the Earth were not spinning, and you were standing at the North Pole, and you threw a ball towards the equator, it would follow a straight line, which totally makes sense, because the Earth isn't moving, so things are just going to kind of go in a straight line. But because the Earth is moving, if you were to take this same ball and throw it in what you think is a straight line, so you think that you are throwing for this target right here, you throw your ball in a straight line, because the Earth is moving, underneath the ball, the path of your ball will actually curve and your ball will land in a different place because the Earth is spinning the whole time, so your target has actually moved to the side. Now, this principle right here is called the Coriolis effect, and the Coriolis effect basically says that things moving north or south on the Earth don't travel in a straight line because the Earth rotates underneath them. So that ball or winds moving over the face of the Earth or ocean currents, if the Earth weren't spinning, they would just travel north to south, but because the Earth is spinning, their path gets deflected off to the side. And we're going to apply that idea all the way through the rest of this video. So one of the major effects of the Coriolis effect is on global wind patterns. The other day, we talked about Hadley cells, which are these guys right here, where if you remember, at the equator, the hot air rises up until it cools off and forms clouds and drops all its rain in the ITCZ. Then it flows back down towards the Earth, gets hot and dry, comes across the Earth and completes its cell. Now, because that air is circulating above the Earth and the Earth is also circulating, you get a situation where wind patterns flow in predictable directions. Along the equator, the wind flows from the east towards the west. And whether you are in north or south of the equator, the wind is going to flow in about the same direction. These winds are called the trade winds because merchants used to use their ships to get from Europe to South America on them. And then we're going to complete the circle and up here above 30 degrees your winds go from the west towards the east. So if you look we have completed our circle right here. And then up here at the poles because the earth is spinning around you've got polar 
easterlies. So recognize that if you are north of the equator, your winds are going to travel in a clockwise direction. If you are south of the equator, winds are going to travel in a counterclockwise direction. And we'll see the same is true for ocean current in a minute. But these winds that blow in pretty consistent directions are a combination of the Coriolis effect and Hadley cells working together. One of the other major things that affects the climate of an area is going to be the tilt of the Earth. Now, we talked the other day about how the Earth is tilted at 23.5 degrees. As the Earth rotates around that sun, the 23.5 degrees become really important. So I'm going to kind of walk you through this, and basically this is going to tell you all about the seasons. So we're going to start right here. North America is right here. It is summertime. If you look, the sun is striking the Earth like this because the Earth is tilted on its axis. The northern hemisphere is pointed at the sun, so the northern, northern hemisphere gets the most intense sunlight, and it is summertime. We then rotate around the sun, and now we notice that the equator is pointed directly at the sun. Neither north nor south is pointed more at the sun than the other, so this would be fall because the heat is pretty well distributed. Then we keep rotating around the sun in this direction, and now we have got the southern hemisphere that is pointed at the sun. So it is summer for the southern hemisphere. We are experiencing winter because we are now pointed away from the sun. And then as we continue our journey around, we get back to the point where the equator is pointed most directly at the sun. The sun's pretty evenly spread out, so it is springtime. And then we continue on back around into the summer. So this whole cycle gives us our four seasons. Um, throughout this whole cycle, we recognize that for the most part, the equator is pointed directly at the sun the whole time. This is why the equator is warmer than anywhere else on Earth. It also means that the equator does not experience seasons. Um, it means that the length of the day at the equator doesn't really change from one season to the next. And it also means that um, as far as seasons go, when northern hemisphere is having winter, summer hemisphere is having summer. Sorry, let me say that again. When the northern hemisphere is having winter, the southern hemisphere is having summer. The rest of this video is going to be about ocean currents because they are one of the other big things that determine the climate of the Earth. Um, so wind patterns has something to do with climate, so does ocean currents. All of our ocean currents start, at, start out at the equator for one important reason. If you look at this heat map here, the equator is the hottest part of the world. We have talked about that a bunch. Let's say you could slice the Earth in half. So let's say here's the surface of the Earth. We are going to put the ocean up on top of it. And let's say that our equator is right here. Because the sun is beating down on the equator most intensely, making it hotter, that means that the ocean at the equator actually rises up a little bit because just like warm air rises, warm water rises. So at the equator, there's actually a little bulge in the ocean. Um, the water at the equator is roughly three inches higher above, or the surface of the ocean is roughly three inches higher than it is at northern or southern latitude. So this bulge in the equator means that water flows downhill north and south. So what this means over here on this map is right here at the equator, your water is bulging up and then it starts flowing downhill towards the North Pole and towards the South Pole. And then we're going to start spinning that with the Coriolis effect, and we're going to get some ocean currents. So one of the ocean currents that you need to know about is gyres. And gyres are basically big ocean currents that go in a circle. Now, the biggest gyre that you'll hear about all the time is the North Pacific gyre. And the way this one works is it runs along the equator right here. Then it goes up the coast of Asia, across Alaska, down California, and back around. And this would be a combination of the Coriolis effect and wind patterns causing this water to go in a circle. There's another gyre down here in the South Pacific. So in the North Hemisphere, all of your ocean currents go clockwise. In the South Pacific, or in the Southern Hemisphere, they all go counterclockwise. Um, we'll talk about the impacts of this more later, but one of the interesting things to note is that any trash that ends up in the water up here in the North Pacific gets stuck in this gyre and just kind of goes round and round and round such that there's a big old garbage patch right in the middle of the North Pacific because all the trash gets stuck there and goes around and around. 
Another ocean principle or ocean current principle you need to know about is called upwelling. And upwelling is a pretty easy um, concept to understand. It's basically this. Ocean currents, as they travel along the bottom of the ocean, eventually are going to run into a continent. When they run into a continent rising up from the sea floor, they get forced up to the top. And the reason that this is important is all of the good nutrients from the surface of the ocean fall down to the bottom. Also, cold water holds a lot of oxygen. So what happens is as this cold water travels along the bottom and then gets forced up onto the surface, it brings a bunch of nutrients and oxygen that is really good for fishing populations. Um, this happens on the west coast of continents. So traditionally, the western coast of continents is very good for fishing. Um, South America is one example. The coast off of Peru and Ecuador is excellent fishing ground because that is a big area of upwelling. And we're starting to near the end, not there yet, but we're getting there. Um, there is also a large ocean current that is known as thermohaline circulation. So basically there's two types of currents on the ocean. There are surface currents. Surface currents are driven by wind patterns and they travel with the wind. So where I talked about those westerlies and the easterlies, ocean currents at the surface do the same thing because the wind just kind of pushes the water along. There's another type of ocean current that are known as deep ocean currents also known as thermohaline circulation, and they are driven by water density. And remember, have this in your head, warm water rises, it's less dense, cold water sinks, also saltier water sinks. So here's what we see in thermohaline circulation. We start out at the equator, and like I talked about at the equator, the water gets warm and it flows north and south. So that water flows towards the North Pole. As it gets to the North Pole, two things happen. One, it gets cold and it starts to freeze. As it freezes, the fresh water gets locked up in the ice and the salt stays behind, so that water gets salty and it also gets cold. So salty, cold water is going to sink down and this blue line, this represents really cold water that is moving along the bottom of the ocean. So at the North Pole, that cold water is going to sink down below, down to the bottom of the ocean and it's going to travel down across South America, across Antarctica, and then over here around the equator, it's going to start to warm up again. As it warms up, it's going to come back to the surface, travel across Australia, around Africa, and complete our loop. Now, let me remind you that the two things that drive this current are the temperature and the density of the water. Note that this is a very slow current, so it could take a molecule of water upwards of a couple hundred years to make the trip from the equator down across the bottom of the ocean and all the way back around again. Also scientists that talk about global warming worry about this ocean circulation pattern shutting down as the ocean gets warmer because one of the things that drives it is this cold water sinking down and become, becoming salty and sinking. If the earth is getting warmer, then glaciers up here are gonna melt, the fresh water is gonna run into the ocean, which means it's gonna be less salty, which means it's not gonna sink, which means that this ocean current may shut down, which would probably have some pretty profound consequences. One last thing on ocean currents, and that is heat transport. One of the biggest functions of ocean currents is to redistribute heat energy throughout the world. Wind currents do the same. Um, and what we see here is red arrows represent warm water, blue arrows represent cold water. And essentially what these ocean currents do is they get warm at the equator. They take that warm water up the east coast of continents. So this is why the oceans off of, I don't know, Florida and North Carolina and up here off the East Coast are pretty warm is because we've got a pretty constant warm ocean current going this way. And because the water is warm, it heats up the air around it. So areas that are near warm ocean currents tend to be warmer than, say, over here, California has got a cold ocean current that comes down it. So California stays cooler because it's by a cold ocean current that's coming down from Alaska. The east coast is warmer because it's got warm ocean currents coming up from the equator. So they take that heat from the equator up, it circulates around near the Arctic, it cools down, and then it travels down the west coast of a continent, and it cools down that west coast until it gets to the equator, and the Coriolis causes it to go around and around again. This is important because it keeps the equator from getting too hot and the poles from getting too cold. If the ocean currents weren't moving this heat around the world, the equator would be much hotter than it is because you wouldn't be taking the heat away and bringing cold water down. And the poles would be much colder because you're not taking that hot water up and the cold back down. So 
recognize that these ocean currents redistribute heat around the world, they also make sure that um, climates are fairly stable and they make a large difference in climates. An example of this is you've got England right here, you have got Labrador, Canada over here. As a result of currents, the winter temperature difference between these two is like 36 degrees. Um, because they're at the same latitude, they should have the same weather, but wet winters in England are fairly warm because you've got a warm ocean current flowing past England, but winters in Canada are very cold because you've got cold ocean currents flowing past that area of the world. So ocean currents profoundly impact climate. Sorry. This is the final ocean current thing for the day. Um, I guarantee AP is going to ask you about the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And this is basically a phenomenon that happens when the prevailing winds in the Pacific shift. So like I said, there are global wind patterns that flow pretty much in one direction all the time. And usually, this is South America, this is Australia, typically those winds blow in this direction from South America towards Australia. As they do that, they push the warm water of the equator towards Australia. So this is why generally scuba diving is super good in Australia and the South Pacific because all of this warm water is being pushed over in that direction most of the time. And the other effect of that is if the wa warm water goes over there, then cold water can upwell along the coast of South America, making the fishing very good. Now, every three to seven years or so, these trade winds, for whatever reason, weaken and switch directions and start flowing in the other direction. And because they're flowing in the other direction, that means that the warm water that was piled up by Australia gets pushed over towards South America. And because that warm water gets pushed over towards South America, it stops the upwelling, which means that the fishing is no good. And then this also causes a shift in weather patterns because rainstorms basically follow warm water. So usually in normal conditions, we have typical weather, but in an El Nino year, we switch directions and we start getting wetter weather in America and we get drier weather in Australia. All right, this is the last slide for the day. I promise, last thing, it is not ocean currents, but it is the last determiner of climate and that is the rain shadow effect. This is easy to illustrate. Let's imagine that you have got a mountain and next to the mountain, you've got some ocean. As winds blow air in off of the ocean, they hit a mountain, they're forced to rise up. We know that rising air condenses and forms clouds and rains down. So this cloud will drop all of its rain on the ocean side of the mountain range. It is now dry and it flows down the other side causing a desert because it's dropped all of its rain. A good illustration of this right here is the state of Oregon. You got the Pacific Ocean over here. These are the Cascade Mountains. Sorry for the disappearance of my ink there, but you can see from the vegetation map that all of the green in Oregon is on the ocean side because those clouds have flowed in. They have dropped their rain. They've made that side lush and green. And then as they flow over the Cascade Mountains and down the other side, it is just dry air. So it dries the rest of Oregon out into deserts. Sorry for that being a very long video. I know it covered a lot of stuff, but make sure that you do get the major points out of it. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and we'll see you again.